friends, welcome back to my channel, Paternosaurus Reads. I'm Katie, aka Paternosaurus, and I read. And today I have my first wrap up of the year, January 2020. I also have some stats. I am using Allie from Hardback Hoarder. I'm using the spreadsheet that she shared of how she tracks her reading, and so I'm gonna be using that as well as tracking my reading on Goodreads this year just to kind of see how those things are different. So I have some stats to share that I've been keeping track of and then we'll kind of reevaluate at the end of this year and see if I want to continue using that, if I want to make my own, if I want to use somebody else's. I probably will not be making my own because I do not have those skills. So I read 12 books in January. I read 2,617 pages, which is pretty good. And I also listened to audiobooks for 26 hours and 20 minutes roughly it it's set out to be like 26.33 so that's 26 hours and 20 minutes um i do listen to audiobooks fast I, I never listen to them at one speed like just regular speed it's at least 1.5 usually two times speed sometimes more than that if the audiobook narrator is really slow so it wasn't 26 real human hours that i listened but i change the speed so much that I don't know how to calculate like the real amount of time that I listened. So I'm just going to go for how long the audiobooks were that I listened to. Those are some stats as well as my average rating which was 3.29 which is not great. Um, January was like an aggressively mediocre reading month for me. It was not great like almost all of my books were 3 or 3.5 and I had a couple lower and a couple higher so it was not the most enjoyable reading month but it is now February 2nd and I've read my first five star book of the year not counting the reread that is in this video that I read in January so let's just talk about the books that I read in January from the worst to the best Okay, the first two books I'm going to talk about are um, in a series. I'm just going to talk about them together. So it's Beautiful Bastard and Beautiful Bitch by Christina Lauren. Um, Beautiful Bastard got 2.5 stars and Beautiful Bitch got two. They were not very good. I think this was like the first work that Christina and Lauren collaborated on because if you don't know Christina Lauren is actually two people it's like a writing duo and they're best friends and that's like really cute. The blurbs at the beginning of Beautiful Bastard were talking about how it inspired Fifty Shades of Grey and I was like wait excuse me and Christina Lauren wrote Twilight fan fiction as like an office smutty romance and that's what Beautiful Bastard is. It's Twilight fan fiction that apparently inspired Fifty Shades of Grey or maybe that was like a whole subgenre of Twilight fanfiction back in the day. I don't really know. But as soon as I started reading it, I was like, oh, the plot has no leg to stand on in either one of these books. It's about, oh my God, I don't know their names. I have immediately deleted this information from my brain. The guy who's the boss and the girl who's like his assistant and they hate each other and then eventually they bang in the office when they're both there after hours. And I really don't like that about office romances. Like the thought of people having sex in their workplace is so like gross to me, which is why I don't read a lot of office romances. But I was like, I just want something light and fluffy. And I was kind of on a Christina Lauren kick. So I was like, yeah, sure, let's read that. And it was not good. Um, when I say that there was sex in literally every single chapter, I'm not joking. At least one sex scene in every chapter, sometimes two. So I don't mind a lot of sex in a smutty book, like that is the point. But when there's so much that there's literally zero plot, that's when for me, it's just not enjoyable, especially when I see no reason for these characters to actually enjoy each other's presence and be in a good healthy relationship because they also like kind of treated each other like crap especially the guy treating the girl badly so it was just like not enjoyable i'm gonna stick with christina lauren's later books their work has improved a lot so if you're like me and you like their new stuff 
I feel like you probably won't like the old stuff, so maybe just like steer clear. Okay, moving on to my three star reads. We're just gonna keep going with Christina Lauren. I read Roomies. I wanted to kind of cleanse my palette of the smutty grossness of the beautiful series. And Roomies was okay. It follows Holland and Calvin. They both live in New York and Holland's uncle is like this big time um, musical genius, kind of like a Lin-Manuel Miranda type. Um, he has a musical that's taken the world by storm, but then one of his lead musicians just up and quits. And there's this guy who plays the guitar in the subway that Holland kind of has a crush on. So she's like, hey, why don't we get him to do it? And as it turns out, his name is Calvin and he can't legally take the job because he came to America to go to Juilliard and then overstayed on his student visa. So he's there illegally. Holland proposes to this dude that they get married so that he can be a citizen. I don't know if he would necessarily be a citizen. Whatever, so he can legally work. And it just so happens that he's really hot and she has a crush on him. She's, she's like, yeah, this is great. So this is fake dating trope to the next level because it's fake marriage trope. There was, I don't know what it was about it that made me not love it. It was just kind of meh. Like right now I could tell you very few things that happened in the story but overall it was definitely not one of my favorite Christina Lauren books it was just like very average middle of the road like meh my next three star read was The Female of the Species by Minnie McGinnis um I've kind of talked about this book before and talked about how I was really excited to read it because this is the first book that I heard about that was like a female revenge story and you guys know I love that but I didn't like this book. Like this was the book that I had built up in my brain as it was like gonna be the epitome of this female revenge and it was gonna be so good. And this really was just not the book for me. It was so much internal monologue and like character self-reflection and that isn't really to my taste. So this book is the book for some people, but it's not really for me. Um, it is about this girl named Alex as she's um, completing her senior year and everyone knows her as the girl whose sister was murdered. The guy who did it, or who a lot of people thought did it, he ended up not being convicted because of a lack of evidence and then he mysteriously died. I wonder who was responsible for that. So you can kind of see where this is going and why I thought I would like it. And it also follows PK, PK, Preacher's Kid, um, as she becomes friends with Alex and Jack, this boy who kind of starts to like Alex and is one of the first people to not see her as just the girl whose sister died. Like I said, a lot of character work in this book, which is not something that can just carry a story for me but if the premise sounds interesting to you and you like that type of story then this might be a really good book for you it just was meh for me my next three star read was babysitting is a dangerous job by willow davis roberts this is a book that i read back to back to back to back to back over and over again when i was a kid i think in third or fourth grade is when i first read it and i found it on script and i was like sure why not and it, it is what it sounds like from the title this girl named darcy darby darcy darcy she gets a job babysitting these kids at this rich house and this skeevy family ends up kidnapping them and holding them for ransom and so the girl has to figure out how to keep the kids safe, keep them not scared, and try to figure out how to get them all out of the situation safely. I remember it being so thrilling when I was, you know, nine years old, and it was fun to revisit it, but it, I mean, it's a children's book. Like, it is a children's chapter book. I am not the intended audience. So while when I was a kid, this was a five star read. I absolutely loved it. 
as an adult, it's a three star read. You know, it was fun, but I'm not the intended audience. So it wasn't going to be a five star read anymore. I don't think my next three star read. I don't even know if it's actually three stars. I don't, it, it's Night Fell by Marcia Pestle. I chose three stars because that's the most middle of the road you can go with a book, but I literally don't know what my opinion is of this book. Like I finished it and I was like, I don't know anything that just happened. <laughs> uh, this book follows, who does it follow? This book follows Scott McGrath. He is kind of a disgraced journalist after he did an interview about this famous filmmaker who in the interview Scott said a lot of crazy things and then ended up getting sued for libel and slander and all these things. So he kind of made a joke of himself and he's now kind of keeping his head down trying to live his life until the director's daughter turns up dead of an apparent suicide. And Scott sees this as his chance to discover what the truth is. Uh, he feels like he was set up to say those things in an interview because someone had called him the night before and said some things like an anonymous tip. So he thinks that he was getting too close to the truth when he was investigating this director guy. So then he jumps back into the world of horror this director makes horror movies and trying to figure out what the truth is what happened to his daughter what happened in the past a lot of weird things um it's kind of fun they do have some multimedia elements in this book like um like this is a page from a like a secret website that fans of this director go to and post theories about his movies, about him and his life and all these things. And this is not really a, a mystery or a thriller. Like this is very literary fiction-y, which I didn't realize when I picked it up, but it is very kind of like the female of the species. It's very internal and there is more action in this and there are like some really exciting things that happen. And I thought this was gonna be found family trope for a minute and I was very excited and then it ended up not panning out and I was like, oh, that's upsetting. Uh, but it's just a very odd book. Did I enjoy reading it? I don't know. I do kind of like how meta it was. Um, that, that part was kind of fun. I do enjoy that in books, but I don't know. This isn't a book that I'm going to reread again. So I have already decided to unhaul it if that means anything. My first 3.5 star read was Emma. It was an Audible original. So it's not just the Jane Austen novel. Um, it was adapted as kind of a, obviously not a screenplay, but sort of an audio play thing. Following Emma, who likes to play matchmaker and sometimes it gets her into some trouble. That's basically the premise of Emma. It was very fun. The performances were excellent, which I think is what gave it that extra 0.5 instead of just a three star. Obviously it was adapted. So there were a lot of narration or there was a lot of narration missing. A lot of it was just dialogue, 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 which for me is kind of the ideal way to read a classic. So I'm okay with that. And it was just really fun. The whole time I couldn't stop thinking about Clueless and the modern adaptation by Pemberley Digital, the same people who did um, the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. I will link that down below if you wanna watch it. It's very good, very fun. The actress who played Emma uh, had like a little cameo in The Good Place. And every time I watch that episode, I'm like, ah, it's Emma. I like Emma, it was a good time, but I don't love classics. So I wasn't expecting it to be a super highly rated book. My next 3.5 star was another Audible original called The Christmas Pact. I don't remember the authors. It will be on the screen. And uh, is that seasonally appropriate? Absolutely not. But did I just want to listen to a cute fluffy romance? Yes, I did. So this is about Riley Kennedy, a woman who works for Publishing House. 
in the fiction department and then there's a man who works in the non-fiction department named Kennedy Riley. So their emails get flip-flopped a lot and he continuously sticks his nose into her business and she can't stand him until eventually they meet and they come to an agreement that they will join each other at their various family Christmas functions in order to kind of save face to make it look like they're both in relationships even though they're not and that's the premise so it's like kind of rivals to lovers and also fake dating trope so that was fun it was very short like because it's an audible original it was not written to be a full-length novel it was a three-hour audiobook like it was very short it was fun I just wish that it had been a little bit longer and we could have sat in that like hate to love moment a little bit longer before we got the fake dating thing because that would have been just like mm, so tasty to have that dynamic between them for a little bit more because we didn't get it for very long and I wish we had. My next 3.5 star read was The Sawbones Book by Dr. Sydney McElroy and Justin McElroy. This is based off of their podcast where they talk about medical history. Um, Sydney obviously is a doctor, so this is her area of expertise. She knows a lot about medical history. And Justin, her husband, uh, does not. So he kind of comes in as the humorous side, and it's a very fun balance. But I think I prefer it in the podcast form rather than the book or the audiobook, which is how I um, consume the book because I thought it, I would be like, oh yeah, it's similar to the podcast. I'm just going to listen to them talk. But because it was so rehearsed, it, it lost some of that signature McElroy humor of Justin thinking of something stupid on the fly and just saying it. And it, it really lost some of the spark for me. Um, if you haven't heard me talk about The Adventure Zone, that is another McElroy family podcast starring Justin and his two brothers and their dad playing D&D, &D, which is super fun. And all of the brothers have a podcast with their wife, which is like so precious. Love them. I also feel like if you listened to Sawbones the podcast super regularly, you would have heard a lot of these stories before about medical history. I have kind of listened bits and pieces to episodes that I was particularly interested in. It's not a podcast that I keep up with like every single week. So for regular listeners, I feel like they probably didn't get a lot out of the book. At least I did. I learned quite a bit and it was interesting. And hearing Sydney just absolutely roast doctors of the past who were like so comfortable with playing God and just saying off the wall bullshit about the human body that was in absolutely no way based on any kind of science or fact. And Sydney, like she destroys them but in like a very calm and pleasant way. And I love her so much. So there were, there was a lot to like about this book, but I, I think I'm still trying to find my footing when it comes to nonfiction and things that I'm really going to like. And even though I love the McElroys and I love Justin and Sydney, I still think that this medical history podcast was maybe not the correct route for me and my interests. My next 3.5 star was I think what I'm most disappointed about this whole month, which was The Hand on the Wall by Maureen Johnson. This is the third and final book in the Truly Devious trilogy, a young adult mystery series following Stevie, who goes to this very fancy prep school in the middle of nowhere, like literally on a mountain in Vermont. And everyone at this school is chosen for a very specific thing. Like they all have a very special thing about them. And Stevie's thing is that she likes true crime. The school that she goes to is actually very famous because it was the site of the most famous unsolved crime of the 20th century. Well, unsolved, like someone got arrested for the kidnapping and murder of the wife and child of the founder of the school. But the consensus is that he's not really the one who did it and he was kind of a patsy. So the whole premise of this book series is that Stevie goes to the school to try to solve the mystery. So it is told in alternating chapters, not every single one, but every once in a while, um, they will pop back to the 1930s mystery and you will learn more about what happened then. And then it'll come back to present day where Stevie is working on trying to find evidence and also trying to solve some mysteries 
that are coming up in the present day because some bad stuff happens at this school and obviously I'm not going to tell you anything that happens in this book because it's the last one uh, but it was 3.5 stars so I didn't really love it I like the resolution of the mystery both the one in the past like especially that one hit me in the gut it was very emotional some of the things that we learned in this book I was like oh my goodness okay lots of things are happening and the resolution of the modern day mystery was pretty good too I don't know it was it felt a little convenient to me like Stevie just kind of pulled it out of her ass and that was annoying I was like where's your evidence like what makes you think this is true but whatever but my big issue with this is the romance aspect of it like normally I love romance in books I like it when there's romance I hardly read any books that don't have romance but I think this book would have benefited so much from just not having the romance between Stevie and this guy named David he's an ass to her a total jerk and in the first two books you learn why he is that way and you kind of understand him and so I thought when we came into this one there would be some kind of resolution to his like jackassery and there just wasn't like he he doubled down on being a huge dick to her all the time and I was like why why are we dealing with this like no Stevie deserves better than this no this is wrong so that really dragged down the rating for me um I also think this might be the shortest in the series and I do think it could have benefited from another 30 to 50 pages just to spread things out a little bit more I don't know it, I'm really sad that this was only a 3.5 because I love the first two books in the series and this finale kind of let me down it was not great okay and now we are on to my one four star read of the month which was Come Tumbling Down by Sean McGuire, the fifth book? Hang on. One, two, three, four. Yes, that, that's four. Fifth book in the Wayward Children series. I do not have a physical copy because I was actually lucky enough to get an arc on NetGalley, so thank you, Tor and NetGalley, for getting me that arc. I was so excited. I think I read it a little after the release date, but that's okay. It was very good. It continues following the storyline from the first book um, so the way this series works is it follows these children who go into these parallel universes like a, a portal fantasy type book and then they come back and they go to this boarding school run by this woman who also went to another world to kind of help them cope with the trauma of leaving these magical places that they thought were their forever homes read of the month was my one and only five star read which is Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. This is about Alex who is invited to go to Yale because she can see ghosts and the secret society wants to have her be part of the group and uh it's called Leafy House and Leafy kind of keeps track of all of the other secret societies to make sure that they're not um abusing their power. Each one of the houses has a specific kind of magic so uh leafy kind of keeps track of that and makes sure that they're not overstepping their bounds essentially and then a towny girl is found murdered on a night that the houses have their rituals so alex thinks that one of them has something to do with it so this book really is a murder mystery and it's very good I love it very much this was my first time reading it physically when I first read it when it first came out I was lucky enough to be first in line on Libby to get the audiobook which I was very excited about and so now I understand why so many people said the first like 150 pages were really slow because reading it physically it, it kind of is it kind of drags a little bit um, even though I have already read the story and I know where it was going I was still like okay come on let's go when you have a really incredible audiobook narrator like Lauren Fortgang who has done all of Lee's books 
I was just happy to sit there and exist in the ninth house space and have Lauren read me a story. So I guess that's kind of the difference that audiobooks and physical books make. I don't know. I still love ninth house a whole, 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 whole lot. I'm so very excited to read book two when it comes out eventually. I know I'm going to be waiting kind of for a while. It's, it's going to be a minute. But you know, as soon as it comes out, I'm gonna snatch it up and read it like on release day. All right, that's it. Those are the books that I read in January. Let me know if you've read any of these books. If you had a rough beginning of 2020 reading wise. I don't know if maybe there's something in the air. Maybe I just had like, very bad choices this month. I don't know. It was just not great. But Hopefully the rest of the year will go better because I really don't want to have a 2020 full of three star reads. That would be very disappointing to me. Leave a comment, like, and subscribe. That's what YouTubers say. I'll see you guys next time.